everybody. Welcome to the podcast. We're so excited today. We are here to talk about another episode of Obscure Animation, where we talk about underrated, underappreciated, and underseen animated films. And we try to have some variety. Today's going to be really fun. We're talking about the Wild Thornberries movie, which I technically have reviewed before on my channel, but it was actually, I think, the second film I reviewed for Family Movie Night. So, Oh, wow. So yeah. <laughs> time to revisit it. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's been like four years, so give me give me this one. It'll be fine. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so I'm Rachel, and Stanford is here to talk about Hi. this. Hey. Yes. Yes. So I'm really excited to talk about this film because I feel like in this case, it's not only a forgotten animated film. I feel like it's a forgotten animated series. And then nobody, I feel like, remembers, except for that meme about the dad that floats around. Uh, yeah. I, I feel like nobody really remembers the Wild Thornberries the way they should. Yeah, because uh, it. I don't know. I just. I love the. I love the show, and I. I think. I wish that it. It was as fondly remembered as your, uh, as your regrets and your Doug and some of those other shows that. Yeah, because it's really not, is it? It's kind of it's just as you said. It's like it's. It's been forgotten, and so I'm glad that, you know, we we can talk about it, and and that you know, and that the movie's cute. You know, they they did a nice job with this film too. So. Yeah. So that's an added bonus for this, I think, for the show. Yeah, this and they probably had a good streak there where they had a lot of really quality shows with uh, Hey Arnold, which I really like. They had Rocco's Modern Life, which was a lot of fun. Uh, and I think later on, I forget when SpongeBob started. So they had... Uh, so they being Nickelodeon, right? I mean, they the Nickelodeon cable network just owned TV, you know, yeah. anima- you know, animation on TV. Yeah, so SpongeBob SquarePants, that started in 1999. That's right. That's why they had the 30th birthday party. Then. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and, it's, yeah. It's almost like SpongeBob Bob's popularity eclipsed the Wild Thornberries, too, right? Because yeah. they, they were, what, 98 to 2003 or four? is that? Sound yeah. right? Yeah, 1998 to 2004. Okay. And so, obviously, they're not going to have the legacy that SpongeBob has because 30 years versus uh, yeah. you know, six. But, uh, but yeah, I, I don't know. They had a – Nickelodeon really had a nice little uh, – run there and we've actually talked about but when i was just doing edited reviews for obscure animation i talked about the rugrats movie which i think is actually more um subversive and interesting that people might give it credit it's not just like a baby movie yeah <laughs> um and uh so that you know that review's in there so we've I've talked about i've talked about the rugrats and um, the wild thornberries uh and I don't know. I just think uh, that the characters are really appealing. I think it's beautifully animated. And I, I think that in the end, I always like stories kind of all about families and they, you know, just have, they have, has a lot of heart to it because it's about a family. Yeah, I totally agree, Rach. I, I really like the premise mm-hmm. of the show, which again, just, you know, transfers so nicely into the film, how, uh, Eliza, who's the main character, you know, the, the little, the little, she was like ten or eleven years old. Um, how she can talk to animals. You know, she was given this gift uh, to to communicate with animals, and then and I, but it just it, it really works. It's not it's not it's not cheesy. It's not dumb. I I just think it's really charming. Yeah, it's really charming. It's really sweet. It's really funny. I kind of got it all, and. Uh, I think because they make Eliza a really likable character. Yes, Eliza's such a good character. Yeah, because she always has sort of pure, pure motives, pure intent. She's trying to uh-huh. do something, uh, and then you know things get messy. And she's trying to figure it out, and and uh, but even like her sister, I think is hilarious. I really yeah. Like I wanted to get your take on 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 her, on her sister. It's Debbie, right? Is yeah, that, Debbie. Um, I, I think she's hilarious. And particularly in this movie. We'll talk more about her, but I, yeah. I don't know. I think they strive just the right balance of making her, uh, I don't know, kind of like a um, L Woods kind of type. Yes, exactly. Yeah. That's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> L Woods in the jungle. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> you do kind of think in this movie, you're like, why didn't they just send Debbie to the private school? Like, yeah. Why? That's just like Debbie would be a lot happier in private school. So would everybody, probably. 
She didn't rule in the school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so when this movie, I mean, when this series came out, I did not watch it when it first started. It wasn't until I, it, it was towards the end of its run because uh, it started in 1998, which was my first year of college. And so I really wasn't watching much TV. I didn't, I didn't have a television in my dorm. Uh, and so it was more just, we'd get together and watch movies in the, you know, the common room or go to a movie, uh, not that much television in, uh, um, 98, 99. And, uh, so it wasn't until I moved out and had a TV that I started kind of finding out about some of these shows Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you know, so kind of caught the tail end of it. Yeah. See, and I never watched it really, you know, Mm -hmm. way you know, clearly way past my time, but, yeah. but I had some nieces and nephews that, you know, love Nickelodeon. And yeah. so, and so I, I was more just had some exposure to it, you yeah. know? And, well, and I went on my mission in 2003. So I guess maybe it was more sort of the middle period. I remember watching it a little bit and seeing yeah. it a little bit, but, but yeah, it was definitely not a time when I was watching it on the TV, but I definitely kind of caught up with it. Yeah. I, I really, really kind of enjoyed it. And do you think that they did a pretty good job in this movie of kind of filling in for people that hadn't been watching the show? I think so. I think that really anybody who even had, doesn't have any familiarity with the show could just could, could watch the movie and, and be able to enjoy it. You know, I think it's, and, and that's a, tr- I think a tricky thing to do, you know, to make it so it's enjoyable for both old timers and first timers, you know, with, with the, with the series. Because uh, I think the people who were familiar with the series would 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 hopefully enjoy it too. You know, it'd be a fun adventure with these characters they already know and 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 appreciate. And uh, but yeah, what's your take? Um, yeah, I think that they did a really good job. I mean, luckily it's kind of a simple premise. Yeah, just like a cute little thing at the beginning. But uh, but yeah, I definitely didn't feel like I was lost or anything like that. And I think one one of the things that's so striking about this film too, just as just you know, as an overview, is really it's just the the animation style that's so uh, indicative of, of of the of the animation studio that did it. You know, Klasky is it Klasky Supo or Klasky Chupo? How do you pronounce it, Rachel? <laughs> um, yeah, I. I... But but you know because they did the Rugrats. <laughs> they did the Rugrats. Yeah, and it's a really distinctive style. And doing a little research for this, I realized you know that that uh, Klasky, I'm going to say Klasky Supo. I'm sorry, mm-hmm. please forgive me if it's wrong. Yeah, uh, but they they did the animation for the first episodes of The Simpsons too. Before when when The Simpsons was on the was on you know when they did those shorts on the Tracy Ullman show, and then the first three seasons, and then. And then um, Gracie Films moved moved the animation over to Film Roman. But, it makes sense because David Silverman, yeah. one of the creators, is one of the big directors, producers, people buying The Simpsons. Yeah. So yeah, that was interesting about that animation yeah. studio and just, again, kind of that style, that animation style that they use. But I think they really amp up the animation for this film. Mm-hmm. Too. I think it really looked, the film, I thought the animation really looked good. Yeah, I I do think that it has a little bit more. You can see that cinematic yes. feel to it. Yeah. In the in the um, uh, in the movie, which is always kind of nice to see. Like, okay, it's worth it. I can put down my my uh, uh, dollars. I I think that the um uh that was something that the My Little Pony movie really struggled with. This kind of is it going to because that show is so pretty. They do such a good job with, in my opinion, of the animation on My Little Pony. It's like, how do you uh, elevate that for make it worth it. Like, why not just stay home and watch episodes of the yeah, show? Yeah, to make it, yeah. And I don't think they completely succeeded in that case. I really, I actually really enjoyed the movie, but uh, but uh, that as far as visually, it, it looked like nice episodes of the show. And this mm-hmm. definitely, I think, looks a step up, which is really nice. And and they were saying uh, in in some of the stuff about the show that originally it was the plan to just talk about the just feature the kids just have it be you know really kid focused on yeah. uh, on eliza uh and uh but the focus groups that they got really uh liked the struggles between the parent-child relationships. Yes. so that's what makes yeah. it, i think that's what makes the show interesting and really unique mm-hmm. 
is that the parents are such key characters. They're not just kind of like these annoying adults, you know, that, that, that are on the, are on the sidelines. This is, it's, it's really a, this family dynamic. And then how they have to really rely on each other because they're in the middle of nowhere. Right. Right. <laughs> You know, and yeah, then, and they're not just kind of like bossing, parents aren't just kind of bossing her around. Like, you could even maybe make the claim that they don't parent enough. I mean, yeah, which, yeah, exactly. <laughs> which you know? is good. And they give, yeah, they give all of their children quite a bit of freedom, I think. Yes. Uh, and it makes sense given the fact that they're these explorers and stuff. Of course, they're going to be that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, you get a little bit more of sort of the stiff, uh, difficult parent with the grandma in the movie but uh but still even even she is not the same as some other shows you know where it's just like the parents are right the <laughs> right exactly although I, i'm with you it's almost like the parents I, they should have either put their foot down or, or sent off debbie to birth of school i mean we'll get to that <laughs> yeah. but I, I think it's a right. real like family show it's yes it's about a family and I it is that. Because uh, and it, there's some like silly jokes, and particularly with uh, with uh, Donnie, there's some you know sort of more puerile jokes. Yes. But uh, but I still think at the core, like it's something that I don't think an adult would be embarrassed to watch. You know, and whereas like I think maybe like Rugrats, there might be a little bit more embarrassment there. Uh, you know, because but it's smarter than you know giving credit for right. uh, or even something like spongebob like until you start watching it and then you're yeah. like wow oh, there's this is pretty subversive and pretty weird yeah uh but this is more just like uh it's more just about like a family experience yeah it's 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 definitely it's it, it's it's a show about the family which yeah really, because really like like spongebob is adult in like kind of weird trippy yes. ways that's not this at all this is just adult in the sense of like we're gonna talk about things that people are really dealing with and mm-hmm. uh, we're gonna have real emotions and stuff like that and still yeah. be funny right so yeah. all right well let's talk about this movie so this movie came out in 2002 so it was right in the middle right yeah right in the middle of its run and there was actually another one uh, that came out with the Wild Thornberries and the Rugrats. Yeah, uh, it was it Rugrats, Rugrats Go Wild? Yeah, Rugrats I've go never wild. seen. I've never seen it either. Yeah, okay, so yes, have you seen it? Yeah. And did you see this movie in the theaters? Do you remember? No, that's the, you know, I can't remember. And uh, so I'm just, not, I'm just not sure. I'm not sure if I did, but I seem very aware of it, particularly because of that Paul Simon song. Uh, that, that that he wrote for the soundtrack and yeah. and which I love this, mm-hmm. this that song father and daughter um, that I got nominated for yeah. best original song too for an Academy Award which was cool undeserved you know because it's, it's really it's good it's I think it's it's definitely yeah. one of my favorite tunes from the film um, but I can't remember yeah how about you um, I think I did I think I did uh, see it I mean I felt like at that, that time in life I felt like I saw almost everything yeah. <laughs> that came that wasn't rated R because at the time I didn't go to rated R movies. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, it's kind of interesting because it outgrossed much uh, anticipated, I guess, uh, uh, Treasure Planet from Disney. For uh, poor Treasure Planet. <laughs> for Tora. That was a disaster. Uh, yeah. So it outgrossed Treasure Planet and uh the um, why is my brain? Uh, I've just done too many podcasts today. The, what is the directors of Treasure Planet? What's wrong with me? John, John, uh, Musker and Ron Clements. Yeah, so so Ron, Ron Clements and John Musker's like fantasy project that they fought for for so long, yeah. it didn't it do so well. And the Wild Thornberries movie beat it, <laughs> not great, but uh, but yeah, it came out on the same day as. Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers. So that's probably wow. not the best. <laughs> Interesting. But still, there's enough of a family market. And then again, at, right in the middle of its run, as we were saying, you know, of, 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 of its popularity on TV, mm. to probably help elevate, elevate it, I would think. Yeah. yeah, so it ended up making $40 million domestically, 
And uh, I don't know how much worldwide, but uh, at the time it was uh, a a small budget. Uh, It's the, let's see, where's the bumps up? Sorry. So so it ended up totally um, getting 60.7 million at the box office on a $25 million budget. So there you go. Pretty good, good way to go. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And yeah. it has eighty percent on Rotten Tomatoes, so certified fresh. And yeah. so that's pretty good for this kind of movie, I feel I like. Oh, it is good. You and know, an Oscar so... nomination, as you said. Yeah. So I was thinking that Paul Simon had written the score, but that's actually not true. No, he just wrote that one song. Um, yeah. And, and there were uh, a lot of different singers on, you know, different styles of music that they put on the soundtrack, you know, everything from P. Diddy to yeah. To Peter Gabriel and and uh, real think, big fish, yeah, and like Baja men, and they're like a Nick Carter song, yeah. <laughs> the Pretenders. Uh, yeah, it Matthews. really is. Yeah, you're right, Dave Matthews. Yeah. and I think it flows pretty well. I didn't feel like a jerking yeah. kind of. It's it not like um, it really worked. Yeah, because yeah. like another movie that I think of that doesn't really work is like something like Chicken Little. A weird soundtrack. <laughs> like, yeah, know, it on. comes across as really disjointed. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 and uh, yeah, it. Uh, I like the I like the Peter Gabriel song a lot. I think that. Yeah, one. I do too. I thought I thought that Peter Gabriel song was was really great. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think he's got a couple on there. Looking at the, uh, you know, at the soundtrack. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, and I. I like I like the score by Drew Newman. Is his name? Yeah, I did too. He's mostly a TV guy, but I think he did a good job with this score. Yeah, and uh, uh, it's directed by Kathy Malkazian and Jeff McGrath, uh, and I I don't know anything about them. <laughs> they're, yeah. they're not a whole lot online, so uh, so but I think they did a good job. Uh, yeah, I think they did a really good job, and uh, and you had in the script Kate Boots. B- 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 Botillier, Botillier. Anyway, and I think that's the real strength of this uh, is both. I think the biggest strength, yeah, the animation I think is really solid. I think the script is really solid, and I think uh, the voice acting is really good. The voice acting—they've got—they've assembled such a unique cast. Mm-hmm. Both, I mean, and, and and you know, clearly the family was intact. They were the same voices that did the family for the TV show. But then they brought in some cool extra talent, you know, for for this film. But of course, I thought I thought of you with the voice of Eliza, Lacey Chabert. Yeah, Queen like, of like, Hallmark. Queen of Hallmark. Very exciting. I know. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah, and they have Tim Curry. Of Tim course. Curry is the dad. Yes. Tim, Tim Curry, and it's um, it's Lynn Redgrave, right? Isn't she the voice? the grandma? I think. Oh, she's the grandma. Okay. Yeah, so she's the grandma. And oh, that's then, right, because the mother is American. Yeah. Right. The, Eliza's mom. I mean, the, yeah, Tim Curry's, you know, Nigel's wife, right? Is, yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, you're, yeah, that's right. And then they have Tom Kane, who is a very experienced uh, voice actor, uh, who is the voice of Darwin, and yeah. he's really fun. He yeah, does a great job. Great. And I really like Daniel Harris as Debbie. I, I do just, too. I think she's hilarious. <laughs> she did a good she does a good job. Yeah. Yeah. So uh all right. Well let's start and talking. Then, what other just a couple yeah. of things with the voice cast if you don't mind? Uh, yeah. It's hilarious that that Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers voices um <laughs> Donnie, you know the oh, little. Oh, really? I didn't even realize that. The little uh, feral uh, child, you know that they, that they had taught. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's flea. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, you know, for this film, they brought in Rupert Everett, yeah, and Marissa Tomei to play this this the Blackburns. Mm-hmm. Which, you know, we we meet them. There. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll talk about them, and then Alfred Woodard. Is in it too. She's playing. The, she's the voice of of the cheetah mom. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and isn't it interesting? It's just another example of how much personality they're able to get out of these animals uh, with them being animated. And here we've just seen this photorealistic. Yes. And if they made wild thornberries, 
photorealistic. Like, <laughs> it might me. work better because then at least you have some humans in there that can talk. Yeah. But, but still, it's just, it's something about that animation that just really works, I think, for these different animals. I think so too. Mm-hmm. I think so too. So uh, we, we get a little bit of, a, of an explanation of the show. We find out she can talk to animals, but she can't tell anybody. And uh, so uh, then we, and we get that, some of that uh, Paul Simon music uh, in the intro. And uh, she, Eliza gets put in charge of these sort of cheetah cubs. And she's kind of playing with them. And one of them ends up getting stolen by these poachers and pretty dramatic scene. Yeah, that's really, it's a dramatic scene and a scene and we probably pretty scary for little mm-hmm. kids, I think too. But you know, they, they handle it in a good way to really set up that, you know, these poachers are bad news. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and you've got Eliza hanging on to the rope rope ladder and, you know, just you really feel like she is such a caring person and such like that you just, and the fact that everybody else is just so quick to kind of write it off and she's like, no, no. And uh, it, it just immediately you like her as a character and you want her to su- succeed. It's a very yeah. effective scene. I think. I think so too. So, yeah, so she gets sent off to boarding school. And yes, but from the insistence of her grandmother. Her grandma, who thinks yeah. she's turning into this, like, savage person. Yeah. <laughs> and it is funny because uh, Debbie so clearly wants to go to London. I know. To go to with her parents. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, they send Eliza off, and, you know, as we were just saying, like, why do they just send Debbie? And But... Yeah, and, and, and it's one of those. I mean, I guess it's. I think that's hard too when, you know, the grandparents are involved, or whatnot, or it can be the dynamic can be tricky. But mm-hmm. it's like the parents, I felt like the parents needed to stand up a little bit more for, for Eliza that she's going to be, you know, that she'd be fine where she is. But yeah, they, they 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 succumb to the grandmother's wishes and send her off. Yeah, I mean, I think that they're generally kind of worried about her with these. Uh, with these poachers and she's just been almost killed yeah, you know, yeah, this rope ladder and everything. And so I think that's more their concern than even just like getting an education or whatever. And maybe they don't feel that way about Debbie. Maybe they feel like, Oh, she's going to be better off if she stays here and learns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah. I mean, I think it's Debbie who says, uh, uh, this is that her sister uh, talks, talks like a monkey and dresses like a geek. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's the Debbie line. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so, yeah, so Liza gets sent to boarding school. She really struggles to make friends because she's, you know, very different. And it's kind of interesting because if you think about right around the same course, two years later, you would get Mean Girls. Yeah. So it's like, it's really meta. Exactly. Because, which is about a girl who's been living in Africa who comes and starts school. I was thinking about Mean Girls too. Yeah. Which and stars Lacey Chabert as one of the. Mean girls. <laughs> Yeah, true. So, everything just ties back in place. I'll but but she finds yeah. out that she has actually accidentally brought Darwin on board. And Darwin is her kind of monkey that, of course, only she can talk to. And he is like an aristocratic monkey. <laughs> it's, such, it's, so, it's so great. It really works. Mm. Yeah. yeah, really fun. And I think Tom Kane does a great job with that mm. kind of role. And uh, there's a lot of funny jokes with him, like when he gets put out into the into the barn and he's all talking to the other animals, and he's just like, uh, uh, and he's just very disgusted. Like, how can we be put in this hay with the hay and the dirt and you know all that kind of stuff? And right. uh, <laughs> and she also gets a roommate uh, at the school. And the roommate is not a, not an animal person or whatever. So, so Eliza has to hide uh, Darwin and there's one point where Darwin's eating peas <laughs> and, and it gets all over the roommate's bed. And she's like, why are there peas? <laughs> I don't know why that made me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I laughed too. <laughs> and so, uh, so Eliza has this very dramatic dream when she's at school and uh, there, she's in the water, and she uh, she finds Tally, 
and she that's the name of the cub the and, and she cub. yeah Maybe that got poached yeah. yeah and she's literally told in the dream you have to come back you have to find why have you abandoned me why have you you know i can't remember exact words they use but uh that you have to that the, the you have to come this is you must go uh the, the shaman is in the dream and he says i gave you this gift for a reason you must not waste time you must go to your destiny and i thought that whole dream sequence was gorgeous really yeah. pretty yeah i think they were wise with i think some of the money that they were that you were they where they put a little extra effort i think a little artistic effort into the animation that's really is really beautifully done i agree mm-hmm. Yeah, and says, Tally is alive, go save him, Eliza. And so she leaves school with Darwin. She goes to London, and uh, she, uh, the, uh, let's see here. Uh, so she goes to, there's kind of, and there's like a little bit of a sort of a, a chase uh, s- sequence in London, <laughs> but somehow she she's able to get Darwin on the plane in a like in a cot in a disguise, yeah. which is kind of funny. funny. They're able to to get back, and so she and she's on the train when she gets to Africa, but she sees some poachers uh, herding a rhino, and her, she hears the rhino calling out to her, so she stops off the train and she goes and saves the rhino. And that's a pretty fun, I think, action scene. Yeah, I think so too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's pretty good. That's, it's, it's, it's a good scene for the, in the film. Yeah. And I do love when, when Debbie finds out that Darwin went to, she's like, the monkey got to go to London. <laughs> <laughs> but so interesting though, with this, when she's saving the rhino, she, she, has the help of these two veterinarians. This is husband and wife team, the Blackburns, as we were mentioning, that were are voiced by Rupert Everett and Marissa Tomei. Mm-hmm. And you know, instantly when I, you know, when I first saw them, I, they, they seemed suspicious. But then they're like, oh, they uh, then when they helped the rhino, then of course, then it casts a little doubt. But then you're like, oh, no, I was right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, I mean, I thought they did just about as good a job as you could do of like obfuscating that the Rupert Everett character, Mr. Tomei character, were the poachers. Yeah, they did a pretty good job. Like, thought that they were, but then maybe they weren't. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, then, uh, then the you have a uh, Debbie reading Jack and the Beanstalk to. To to uh, Donnie, Donnie, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's one of my favorites. <laughs> Bean, <laughs> <those> things, uh, <laughs> um, but then I uh, let's see here. Um, so then Debbie is put in a cage, and uh, but then she escapes, and she goes. Uh, she goes after uh, after her, them in a motorcycle. Uh, she's trying to, so it kind of, there started to be this other plot line of Debbie on her adventure uh, with the uh, native kid. I don't know what you call him. I don't know if he has a name. Uh, but, yeah. uh, <laughs> but anyway, there's sort of her plot line and she kind of gets a little bit softer the more that she kind of gets into scrapes and is saved by this, this, uh, <laughs> this feral guy. This very old. Uh, Boko is the name of the of the boy that did. Okay, Loco. I can remember his name. Yeah, Boko. Yeah, yeah. And so there's some. There's also some nice action there, and and you know, sort of her with the uh, with the natives, and you know, so they sort of protect her at times, and and uh, and she is kind of uncomfortable with them, and uh, there's some you know there's some jokes, but there's some also some sweet moments I think with that whole thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, and uh, so then let's see here. Do, 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 do. Okay, then so Eliza is um, uh, so yeah. Debbie goes after Eliza, and because uh, she's still trying to find Tally, Eliza, and the parents are looking for both girls. At a certain point, they come back; both of them are gone. Yeah, uh, and so they're trying to find them, and uh, so. Basically, 
uh, the poachers trick, because she still thinks they're good, the poachers trick her to, trick Eliza to, to show them where these elephants are, because they're all kind of gathering together as a herd. And yeah, the herd's getting together. There's going to be an eclipse. Mm-hmm. And so the herd is all gathering at this one particular point, right? Or going to this particular location. Yeah. And, uh, and so they, then Eliza finds out that they have Tali and that they're the poachers. And of course she's horrified when she actually sees in there in their unit, she finds Tally in a cage and she sees all of there uh, and realizes what she's done. So then it's sort of her new goal is not only to save Tally, but then also to save the elephants. Uh, so then Debbie ends up getting uh, taken by the poachers and they're going to, they're going to kill Debbie. And so then, so then Eliza has to admit in order to save Debbie that she has powers and then she yeah, loses her powers. How, the, how did, how did Eliza know what was going on with the elephants? Right. And they were, right. yeah, you're going to kill Debbie. Mm-hmm. Those are, those are, they're bad people. Those Blackburns, they're, yeah, uh, they're really they're bad. bad news. <laughs> The and then, but but I just loved it. It was just like enough with the poor, enough with the poor me. I've lost my magic powers, bit. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and then Debbie, I think Debbie is the one who says, "You were never ordinary, even without yeah, yeah. Your powers." And so then the um, uh, the poachers end up setting off explosives at the top of the herd to try to get them to move create this stampede and uh and so uh then but then eliza is able to kind of stop it because she's able to to show without her talking to them she's able to show the elephants where the the fence is and exposes that there's this fence yeah and uh and so uh, that's a pretty it's a pretty good scene it's a pretty exciting scene and you know and eliza she has to you know she said she she has to use some serious ingenuity because she's lost her, she's lost her powers. And so she, she really is extra brave. I think she'd do it with her powers anyway. You know, she'd do exactly what she did, but uh, it's just another demonstration of her showing her bravery and also really her care and love for, for animals. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so Sloane, one of the the poachers, he throws Eliza in the river. She's going to go over a like a waterfall, yeah. and uh, and so uh, then then she has to kind of figure out what to do, and to uh, she talks to the shaman. The and, shaman shows up again. Yeah, yeah. saves her. Yeah, and uh, he says, "You did this not with your gifts, but with your heart." Mm-hmm. So she gets her powers back. Her powers back, yay! Yeah, and the elephant gets to thank her, and the the uh, the blackbird, the poachers are exposed, and they're, they're busted. Custody, busted. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and so then. Uh, yeah, that's basically the end of our movie. So she's able to still have her powers. And I don't know, it's just a really sweet, funny, heartfelt little movie. Yeah, so definitely. People should check out. You know, and one, I think one of the coolest things, too, at the end of it, Rachel, is that Debbie, you know, Debbie knows now that her sister has got powers. And, but what, what's held over her is that if she tells anybody, because now the two of them know the secret, not just mm-hmm. you know, not just Eliza. That, that, that Debbie will get turned into a baboon. Oh, yeah, <laughs> so, that's right. I never heard of that. Yeah, <laughs> she has to, which is again just kind of another funny thing because she's you know so disgusted by that prospect mm-hmm. that that keeps her you know will keep her in check. But but I think that that's an important thing for for the sisters' relationship. Mm-hmm. You know, to because Debbie's so I mean they're so different from each other, but I think it's good for Debbie to see. You know, I mean, to know what special abilities her sister has, even though her, Debbie did admit that there's nothing ordinary about Eliza anyway. Yeah. With or without powers, you know, with or without the special power. And I think really Debbie kind of realized that she's more than all this superficial stuff too. Yeah, exactly. 
that she was kind of surprised at all the stuff that she could do mm-hmm. and also her forming this bond with this loco like, yeah yeah kid that that kind of surprised her too and uh so uh, i i i didn't i should have well, preparing for this podcast i should have written I mean, I should have watched the episodes following this, but I, I didn't. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, this is the world of, of reboots. And this is one that I feel like, I always feel like a remake, you should remake things that people that are quality that people don't know about. And I feel like this is a perfect example of something that's perfect to reboot because uh, it's really good. It has such good bones. It has such good. Yeah. The only thing you might have to change is maybe Tim Curry just because of his health and everything, but everything else you could you could still get. Yeah, you could do, yeah. You know, and I, or I guess is Lynn is Lynn Rickrave? She's not alive, right? Uh, you know, I don't remember. Uh, yeah. But so the, yeah, they'd have to do some recasting, possibly. You know, yeah. Probably, so she most passed. Likely. But. but but yeah, so they'd have to do a little bit of recasting, but for the most part, they could get everybody. And uh, and I, I just think it, it's such a sweet, heartwarming show with good action, beautiful animation, and uh, you know, a nice message. And I, I don't feel like that much of it is outdated. Like I feel yeah. like it's pretty, like for lack of a better word, pretty woke for two thousand. Yeah, it really is. Nineteen. It really is. You know, I mean, they're not talking about posting their videos on YouTube or whatever, but they are, they're out filming stuff. Yeah. Which is, which is so cool. Yeah. Because, this, and, and also awesome. like both parents are both part of making this documentary, yes. whatever series they're both working. They're not both, uh, you know, valued and equal. Like there's nothing misogynistic about it. There's nothing. No. Uh, and it's, you know, they're trying to save, she's trying to save these animals. So that's, you know, very modern. And yeah, uh, I don't know. I just feel like it's very contemporary and would translate very well. Yeah, and I agree. With the right marketing, I think it could do really well. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, it, and because, you know, a lot of these relationships are set up in this TV series, you know, they don't necessarily explore it. But what I like about it too is it's, it's a family that, that, even though they've got their challenges, they function well together and they help each other. Yeah. Because the parents have to come in, you know, at, at certain points to help try to help save, do their part to help save the kids or, or just to, you know, assist w- with things too. And, and I just, I just, I just like how they do it. And it's not like the parents then chastise the children or do all this stuff. You know I mean? It's just, they just work together. And I, I like that. Mm-hmm. I like that about just the show, you know, generally. And, and it translates, I think, into the movie. Yeah, I agree. I definitely agree. So, yeah, we really like it. Let us know what you think of the Wild Thornberrys movie, if you have seen it, uh, where it, where you think it ranks amongst some of these other Nickelodeon shows, and then this movie, how you think it does. Uh, I, I really I really enjoy it. I'd give it, like, a, I don't know, like, a solid, like, B+, plus, maybe, a, like, a 7, 7.5 out of 10, something like that. Yeah. I think it's it's a real good little movie, and uh, so yeah, let us know what you think, and let us know if you have any suggestions for our next obscure slash unappreciated animated uh, podcast. We'd love to hear your thoughts. And uh, Stanford, where can people find you? All right, I'm on Twitter at Stanford Clark, and also I have a movie blog and podcast, which is at moviespastandpresent.com. Great. And you can find me at Rachel's Reviews, all of our social media, and on iTunes and YouTube. And so if you're watching on YouTube, give us a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel. If you're listening on iTunes, please give us your ratings and reviews. We really, really appreciate that a lot. Also consider becoming a patron. We have a patron group on Facebook where we talk about animation, we talk about Hallmark, we talk about tons of stuff. It's really fun. Pretty much whatever you want to talk about, we're going to talk about and uh, have fun discussions. So definitely check that out. We'll have the link in the description if you're interested. And uh, so thanks again. This was really fun to talk about. And hey, thank uh, you. look forward to next week, next month. <laughs> yes, definitely. Thanks. Bye. Okay, bye.